Twinkle, twinkle, little star. A ball of gas that I hope explodes is what you are. It's a grumpy cat. <laughs> of course he's grumpy. But uh, okay, let's talk about the evolution of the universe. Um, we can talk about the cosmological principle. This is the idea that the universe should be homogenous, which means the same everywhere, but also isotropic. And it sounds like it's the same thing, but it's not. I mean, isotropic means same in all directions. It just means that the different directions that you look actually matter. And it turns out this becomes really important because although they thought that this should be the case, that the universe should be both homogenous and isotropic, turns out it's not quite isotropic. If you look at the cosmic microwave background radiation, for example, you would think it should be the same in all directions if this is the case. But there's small places where it's not isotropic. Now, there's small places where it's what we call anisotropic. So there's small anisotropies. Ooh, what a nice word. So, for example, this one here, I think it was, uh, they did some different studies. One was called WMAP. Uh, I think it was the Wilkinson Microwave and Isotropy Probe, for example, and Kobe and Planck. These are different ones where they actually started looking at these different, very slight fluctuations and variations in temperature. And I mean slight. So it is pretty much isotropic. However, on a very, very small scale, you can see these weird little things happening. Turns out this is one of these ideas that, well, maybe these are the places, you know, the places where it's not quite uh, the same. These could be places where, you know, dark matter might form. These could be like the seeds of matter now. So we think there might be a relation between sort of dark matter and maybe even dark energy and these fluctuations in the cosmic microwave background. So that's pretty interesting. Now we can talk about what's called a critical density. If you've ever seen the movie Back to the Future, it's an older movie, but I absolutely loved it as a kid. It's actually really worthwhile seeing. I'm surprised at the number of my own students who have seen it. But it's a great movie. If you haven't seen it, Back to the Future, the first one especially. Um, Marty McFly, he goes back in time, and he actually meets his dad basically in high school. He's getting picked on, and he's really hoping to uh, you know, impress a girl who ends up being Marty's mom. Uh, so George McFly, that's the father, he's supposed to be trying to say, like, I am your destiny. Of course, he screws it up and says, I'm your density. So I thought, all right, here we go. So the universe, imagine, now remember, we, we talked about how the universe is expanding. But remember how mass attracts, doesn't it? Doesn't mass always attract? So no matter how the universe is expanding, it should be slowing down. That would make sense. All right, so the universe should be slowing down. So the question is, what do you need to slow it down and maybe stop its expansion? All right, this is actually what we call the critical density of the universe. It's a density needed to actually completely stop the expansion of the universe, assuming this is the case. So um, turns out this here is what we have. This is the result, and I'm just going to show you how we can derive it. This is what works for a galaxy, works for the universe. So this is actually a number we can figure out. So do you remember Hubble's law? Hubble's law um, was this uh, thing that the recession speed of galaxies is equal to the Hubble constant times the distance. But I'm going to put in an R here just to make it sort of work out. So we're going to have V equals H zero R. And we're also going to have a total energy of a galaxy. Now, just like anything in orbit, right, which a galaxy, you know, has things in orbit in it, the total energy of the galaxy is just going to be the kinetic energy plus the potential energy. So in this case right here, then, we could say that the total energy will be, let's see here, ET, it'll just be half mv squared. Maybe I should make that look like an equal sign. Uh, it's supposed to be plus the potential energy. But if you remember, the potential energy is minus gm over r. So we put a minus there because it's actually negative. So that's the total energy. Now, the total energy is usually positive. That tells you if it has enough kinetic energy to actually rotate. But the limit for a galaxy then is when the total energy equals zero. So what we're going to do, we're going to set this whole thing right here equals zero. Okay, we're going to say then that zero equals one half mv squared minus gm over r. Oops, another m needed. So what we're going to try to do then is manipulate this equation here in order to help us out. So what I'm going to do is first maybe move this one over onto the other side. Maybe I'll change colors just to sort of keep the different steps. 
So um, I'm going to move this minus GMM over R to the other side just to keep everything positive because I don't really like negative signs here. So GMM over R equals half MV squared. Well, if I divided both sides by small m, I would get them to cancel out because you'd have m over m, which is 1. So that's nice. So now we have this idea here that gm over r equals uh, half v squared. Or we could then say that you know v squared over 2 then equals gm over r. All right, now what? Well, now what we can do, keep in mind, we can put in, for v, we can put in v squared here. So we can put in that. So that means we end up with... Um, so instead of v, we put in h0r, but all that is squared because v is squared. All that over 2 equals g m over r. Keep in mind that we can do something else. So you know, notice we're supposed to have a density. So do you remember what density is other than this, right? You are my destiny. Uh, remember what density is. Let's do another step maybe. I'll do it in, I don't know, red, I guess. So remember that density, maybe we'll do it off the side here. Density, just like this, right? Density is a mass over volume, All right? Which is m mass over volume, which is uh, remember the volume of a sphere is four thirds pi r cubed. So if we want to get mass by itself, do you see that? I could just multiply the four thirds pi r cubed up to the other side, so I end up with four thirds pi r cubed rho, because that's the density. So I'm going to put that instead of that. So you see how now I'm now going to just square everything. So I have h0 squared. Let's put that in. So I've got h0 squared. I've got r squared over 2. This gets a little bit annoying. It's just a matter of bookkeeping. Times g times m. And m is 4 thirds pi r cubed rho. But don't forget, I've got to divide by r. So what does that r do? Uh, well, it's kind of interesting. Look at this. This r we'll cancel out that one up there and leave an r squared. But look, you've got an r squared on one side, an r squared on the other side. So actually, all of your r squareds, everything cancels out. All of those cancel out completely. So that's kind of nice. So just to fix it up a little bit, let's say, just to, I guess some people like to see all the steps here. Um, I have h0 over 2 equals, let's see here, 4 thirds, I'll just put the number in front here, times g times pi, no r needed, times rho. Now I want to get my, um, let's see here what I want to do. I want to get rho by itself. So to get rho by itself, what do I have to do? Let's first start off by um, flipping this fraction. Remember, to get rid of it, you can do the opposite. You can divide by 4 and multiply by 3. So I hope you're okay with that. I'm going to do that. So that means I get h0 over 2. And what am I going to do? I'm going to multiply it by 3 over 4. That's going to be equal to g pi rho. Don't forget what that's going to do. Also, I'm going to sort of just flip the whole equation around just so it looks a little bit nicer to look at, okay? So I'm going to say uh, g times pi times rho. I think it's just a little bit nicer to look at. Is equal to, let's see here, we have h0 squared. Uh, whoops, actually, let's put the number in front. We have a number 3 in front of it, don't we? So we'll put a 3 here. Whoops. So we'll see 3. I really hope I'm doing it right. It's looking closer here. So 3h0 squared over 8. Hey, that's looking good. Um, so now to get rho by itself, then, i got to divide by the g and the pi. So I'm going to say it's 3h0 squared over 8, and I divide by g pi. So 8 pi g. What do you know? This we can call it critical. So what do you know? This is the same as this. <laughs> yes, it worked. So what does this do? This is the density of the universe that you need in order to stop the expansion. That's why we call it critical density. Now the practical issue is this. To know the, to the actual density of the universe, step one, you'd have to know the mass of the universe. We don't know that. Step two, you need to know the radius of the universe. We don't know that. It's not even in 3D. It's in four dimensions or more. So it's way worse. So the problem is we can't really know the density of the universe, but we can know the critical density of the universe. That's why it's I'm your density. So there we go. We did that derivation. So well done. Now let's look at the scale factor. Um, I love this. Your pseudoscience makes Carl Sagan sad. He's like, mm -hmm. uh, this is a part taken from his uh, Cosmos series. That's a great, great series. They even redid it with Neil deGrasse Tyson. Both series, awesome. One obviously is a sign of its times here. But uh, we can call this density parameter. Or we can call this little symbol right here. Uh, this is omega. I will put a little O uh, by it. 
and that would be the density of the universe divided by the critical density which means you know if you're equal to the critical density then that's a one you know and if you can be uh, greater than or less than then you might have a one or greater than one or less than one and we're going to talk about how supernovas of type 1a are going to come in to save the day this is a photoshopped version of the crab nebula that i showed you in another video i love it's so cute how they made it into a little guy right here with a cape because he's a supernova oh. let's talk about this so scale factor this is the size of the universe on the y-axis which we don't really know what to put here and time of the universe we don't really know what to put here but it turns out this is really amazing about it okay is that our understanding of the universe hinged upon um, this concept that knowing the density of the universe would tell us the destiny of the universe. Now we're really going to sort of George McFly's thing here, right? So that we're really mixing up density and destiny. Because it used to be thought that as long as you knew the density of the universe, you could figure out what's going to happen. And here was the idea. If you look at old exams before this current syllabus was live, old exams always asked you one of these three things. And it turns out, can tell you all three of these are actually wrong and yet they are always asking you this they would say all right the universe's expansion it should be slowing down because mass attracts and that made sense at the time so that meant you could have three different cases you could have a case where it does this in other words the universe this is over time and this would be like present this would be now we can say, well, the universe, um, do you notice its expansion, it would stop expanding eventually and then come back in on itself. Some people call that the closed universe. That's when we say that the density is greater than the critical density. In other words, you have more mass needed. Remember, if you have more mass, that means you have enough to stop the expansion, but you have so much mass, you're going to make it come back in on itself. Some people call that a big crunch. Uh, with this density parameter, you could say then that this density parameter right here, you could say is uh, greater than 1, for example. The other idea was, hey, what if it's exactly the right number to make it? Basically, can you see this dotted line right here like this? It becomes asymptotic right here. This is called a uh, flat universe, what they would call it. This is where your density is exactly equal to your critical density. You have the exact amount of atoms in the universe to the atom to make the expansion stop, and that's it. So that would be when, you could say this density parameter here equals one, right? Because that would make this this over this being one, that means this has to be equal to that. And the other idea was uh, this concept that, well, maybe, I mean, it's still curving like that. This was called open universe. That's when the density was greater than, uh, whoops, sorry, less than the critical density, which is when your density parameter then would be less than one. So this was the idea behind it. Uh, this meant that your expansion is still expanding. It just doesn't stop. And notice all three of these graphs, how they curve. They all, if you know about calculus, do you know? notice the second derivative of all of these is negative. What does it mean to have a second derivative that's negative? It means they all curve downwards. Do you notice they're all sort of curving downwards at least? That's because we expect that the universe, on average, should slow down its expansion. The question is if it slows down enough to stop it, or slows down so much it goes back in, or just slows it down as it expands. Notice all of them necessitate this idea of slows down. Here's the problem. Uh, not very long ago, actually just a few years ago, um, it was seen that all three of these are wrong. Analysis of these supernovas of type 1a, remember those ones? Those are the ones where we can actually tell because we know their mass is 1.4 times the um, uh, solar masses, that's the Chandrasekhar limit. Because of that, we know that they're exactly that. We could actually um, know from their luminosity what the distance is. So these supernova type 1a, they show distances to galaxies accurately. And here's the problem. Galaxies were farther than expected. And what that meant, if you actually brought it back to this graph, it's insane. What it means is this. The graph actually curves up. Uh, whoops, I should be very careful. It doesn't curve sort of up to infinity. It just sort of, it's just curving up. And it turns out I actually curved downwards before about, we're not sure exactly, but around 2.1 billion years ago, it used to be curving down and something made it curve up. So that's even more interesting. You don't have to know that for the syllabus, but still it curves up. And this is a gigantic, you know what that means. So WTF moment. It's like, what? The universe is expanding at an increasing rate and an expanding rate. It's not slowing down, it's speeding up. Uh, this makes no sense. 
there should be nothing that could do that. We know that mass attracts, right? It's called the Newton's universal law of uh, gravitation. It's supposed to apply to everywhere in the universe that mass attracts. It means they all slow each other down, right? They attract each other at least. And this basically says, yeah, maybe, but on large scales, not happening. There's something making it increase at an increasing rate. Do you notice it's curving upwards? There are two uh, groups of scientists who actually won the Nobel Prize in physics for this graph, basically. It's also how they found it and what it means, right? It's not just for a dick graph. But it turns out we don't know what's causing this. All we know is that there's something there, and there's no doubt about it. Something there is making the universe expand at an expanding rate, which is insane. That's why I love this picture of Jackie Chan of <laughs> this monkey here. It's an orangutan, I think. Uh, so there's something acting opposite to gravity, and we can't see it. Now, we can't call it dark matter. Now, we call it dark because we can't see it, but it doesn't have mass. Remember, I mean, mass attracts, so we can't call it dark matter. It's got to be something that repels mass. So, uh, I don't know. I guess we'll call it dark energy for now. We don't even know what to call it. That's how new this is and awesome. We actually don't know what it is. So that's the your story kind of ends there. Like this, so one does not simply believe in dark energy. Oh, yeah, okay. Thanks, Lord of the Rings. That's Boromir, I think, right? I like this Neil deGrasse Tyson. Enjoy life now. Dark energy is tearing the universe apart. That's true. Because of the universe expanding at an expanding rate, it looks like we're going to be not a big crunch, but a big rip. The universe will just keep expanding and expanding until the distance between galaxies becomes so much we won't be able to see other galaxies. It's a little bit sad, but that seems to be the eventual fate of the universe. Pretty interesting, though, huh? Finally, as space expands, the wavelength also increases. So because of that, we can say that, um, you know, the scale factor is proportional to the wavelength, right? Because that it gets bigger, then the wavelength gets stretched. Remember, for black bodies, we have this temperature and um, wavelength component here. So from there, you can actually see that the temperature is proportional to 1 over the wavelength. You see that because, you know, we can put the wavelength down on the other side. Now, it turns out temperature and scale factor, remember, these are proportional. So because of that, we could say that temperature is proportional to 1 over the scale factor. Because scale factor does the same as the um, wavelength. So what this means then is this, that the temperature and scale factor are related. I like this. Can you curve my grade? Yeah, sure. I'll give you a curved F. So this is also an important thing then, that the temperature, it turns out, and scale factors seem to be inversely related. That's an interesting little thing, I guess. And let's do an actual exam question. Explain how a white dwarf can undergo a type 1a supernova explosion. We've talked about this before, so let me just do it maybe quickly. I'll just type it out. Uh, what can we say here? Um, type 1a, well, let's see. It's a binary star system. We could say that, right? Because that's what it is. Uh, white dwarf. Uh, let's say has a mass less than um, the Chandra. Good luck spelling that. Remember, that's the 1.4. Right? So it has mass less than that. Um, we could say the white dwarf. Can't spell today. Um, gains enough mass from the companion to uh, to equal 1.4 m sum. When it does that, it goes uh, supernova, makes a neutron star. But the important thing is the uh, luminosity uh, tells us the distance. Actually, we don't even need that. Actually, we just needed to say go supernova and mix a neutron star. We actually only needed this because we were just asking uh, how can it undergo it. So now we say below is a sketch of how a scale factor varies for a closed universe without dark energy. That's key. Okay, so without dark energy. Uh, type 1a supernova showed the existence of dark energy. Sketch as a dotted line how the scale factor R varies in a universe with dark energy. You essentially had to do what I just showed you before, which is that instead of going uh, curving downwards, it actually curves upwards. And you don't have to get the bottom part here. You know, all they care about is you make it curve upwards. That's the important part. See, that's how you do this. So it's kind of mind-blowing stuff, right? But this is how you can deal with dark energy and actually solve exam questions for it.